Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mary Beth Willard. She is an associate professor of philosophy at Weber State University. She received her PhD from Yale University and writes primarily in aesthetics. She is the author of Why It's Okay to Enjoy the Work of Immoral Artists, which I love, by the way. So, Dr. Willard, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Okay, so uh, let me ask you first. So if you read the title of the book, it seems at first sight to be a book about ethics, because I mean, the question is, is if it's okay, and if it's okay, usually is a question uh, coming from ethics to enjoy right, the work right. of immoral artists. So, uh, but since you work primarily on aesthetics, to what extent do aesthetic questions play a role in this book? I mean, for example, questions like what is art? What distinguishes art from other activities? What makes for good and bad art? What are the criteria to evaluate art? What are the functions of art? I mean, do those questions play an important role here or not? Not directly. So uh, one question I don't really take up in the book is what is art? And partially that's because I find that question really hard to answer. I, I'd say in um, aesthetics, there have been a lot of people who have tried to answer it, you know, all the way back from you know, Plato and Aristotle to the present. And it really turns out to be pretty hard because if you think that you know, painting is supposed to be realistic representation or something like that, then you don't know what to make of abstract or conceptual art. So I find personally that defining art most of the time isn't all that important because often what we're asking is not like, does this meet a certain definition of what art is supposed to be? But when I ask whether something's art, I'm asking, is it worth my paying attention to? So for the purposes of the book, I took art as broadly as we could. So it includes uh, a lot of popular culture, a lot of um, um, popular music or comedians. So anything that could be broadly considered artistic, I consider as relevant for this book. And I didn't really take up the question so much of whether it's a fine art or whether it's a uh, you know, popular art or does it really count as art. Um, that said, I do think that uh, one of the th themes that I explore in the book, especially in the last chapter, is the importance of art to our lives, right? Whether it's high art or low art or whether you reject that distinction entirely. I think one of the things that makes this question interesting is that it's we're not just asking like whether it's okay to buy groceries from somebody who's a jerk or whether it's okay to uh, you know, read a how-to manual put together by a technician who um, was abusive to somebody. <laughs> Rather, we're asking, you know, I have this project of, you know, enjoying music or writing stories or engaging with um, literature or, or what have you, laughing at comedians. And how do I merge that, right, this really important aesthetic project that I have, which helps me understand the world or maybe forms an important part of my time with this ethical consideration that in some indirect sense, I'm supporting a bad person if I uh, continue to consume their art. So I think the aesthetic project is really important because I think if it's just a question of like likes or dislikes, it misses actually how much art um, affects our lives, right? I, I always come back to thinking of like the song that you played at you, you know, your wedding, right? Or the, uh, the amount of time that you spent uh, enjoying a Netflix series with your friends, right? And talking about it and discussing it and all of these things that you do. And then just to say, well, the person who created these things is bad. That's actually a really tough question to say, do I give up all of that? So I can, you know, either make a statement or, you know, make sure that I'm not morally tainted by this person. And I think that that's, that's where the really interesting question is. So the book does uh, deal with aesthetic questions to the extent that I think that that's important for thinking about how we interpret the art. But I don't really take up the question of what is art, mostly because I, most of the time I don't find that a terribly interesting question. Uh. Yeah. Do, do you approach the question starting from any ethical system or any set of moral questions or moral values, let's say? Because, I mean, I was wondering, uh, the, the kind of answer you give here, would it also apply to 
people with different sets of moral values from other cultures, for example. I mean, whatever you might consider to be an immoral artist, uh, you think that the question you give here would still apply? I think so. I mean, I think part of it is that in, in the context when I'm writing the book, we were focusing right on the Me Too movement is most of the, where's where most of the examples come from. But mm -hmm. there's been questions like this in other contexts too. what to do with uh, uh, the, the case of Wagner, right, who is uh, unabashedly anti-Semitic, right? Uh, wh what do you make of uh, his music? What do you make of, uh, you know, Caravaggio, who famously murdered somebody over a uh, kind of a lover's quarrel? Um, <laughs> in Italy. Yeah, I mean, but nobody thinks of that when you look at the paintings, right? So I think um, there is something, I hope, sort of universal about it, right? In, in that the way that we debate it is going to say, okay, so what did the person do? How does this influence how I should interpret their artwork? Um, that said, I don't try to, I really didn't want to do this because I didn't think it would be possible to draw a line and be like, okay, like if you've committed this many crimes, now I have to t like reevaluate your artwork. But you know, if you just like took candy from a baby, I'm not going to bother, right? Um, you did ask though, like, whether I approach it from the perspective of any ethical system and not directly, um, mostly because I wanted it to be very readable and talking about whether things fit into ethical systems is kind of boring. But, <laughs> what, I, <laughs> but what I did um, is I thought like of the kinds of questions that people uh, would ask me as a philosopher, uh, you know, I talked to like the, the bike mechanic who fixed my bicycle about Cosby because it came up. I'm like, oh, I'm writing this thing. And he's like, oh, what do you think about Cosby? And he's like, I can't stand the man anymore. And, or, you know, my doctor asked what I was doing at work and I explained it to her and she had all sorts of questions. So the approach of the couple chapters was, uh, the first three chapters especially, was to think of the kinds of questions people often ask themselves, like, do I have an obligation to boycott artists? And I thought, that kind of maps onto sort of a utilitarian outlook. Like, am I going to make better consequences for the world if I uh, boycott artists who are uh, immoral in whatever way I understand that to be important? Um, how should I understand uh, my, my obligation to my community? Um, that's a lot of the third chapter. How do I improve myself, right? Can I listen to R. Kelly and still be a good ally of uh, victims of sexual assault uh, in like my real life social circles, right? Or do I have to kind of like take on this project of self-improvement, which means pushing uh, artists like that out of my life. So there's definitely a sort of utilitarian moving into virtue ethics uh, strain of the first couple of chapters, but I didn't explicitly say like, well, here's what consequentialism would say, because I, I find that kind of paint by numbers sort of ethics, not really to reflect like how we approach these questions in real life. And real questions, were, real life were drawn all sorts of ways. Um, I think I mentioned this in the book, but there's a, uh, um, but this came up a lot of times when I would talk to people about Michael Jackson. They're like, I love Michael Jackson. Like who doesn't love Michael Jackson? His music is great, especially if you're my age. And that was like the pop music of your childhood. Yeah. But then they'll say something like, maybe I can enjoy his music up until the point where he started um, abusing children, right? So like all of his stuff with the Jackson 5 is okay and all of his early career is okay. So you get Thriller, right? you get off the wall. <laughs> But you, you lose all the stuff in the 90s. And like, there's this line that's that's kind of like saying like, you know, his later stuff is tainted, right? Because it comes after he was harming people. But up until that point, he hadn't harmed anybody, so it's okay. And I obviously that's not like a really principled way to draw a distinction on whether, you know, you should continue to listen to an artist. But it was curious to me that that's what people kept saying, which is like, and I'm like, this is really about like feeling pure or feeling complicit or you know, being able to enjoy something with a free conscience. It's not actually a consequentialist argument, right? Because like money is money, right? It doesn't matter if I'm like, oh, I'm only listening to ABC one, two, three. I'm not listening to Smooth Criminal. That doesn't make a difference. Uh, so I think uh, what I tried to do was capture the kinds of intuitive arguments that people give when they think about these questions. Mm -hmm. But when enjoying uh, art, should we try to separate the artist, the person herself from the work of art or that specific piece of art? Because, I mean, perhaps this is two different questions. The first one is that and the other one, I mean, can works of art be immoral themselves? 
So I didn't take up this question directly, um, but yes, I think they could be, right? So the, the weird thing is up until, um, in, until my book, um, Eric Mathes' book, uh, most of the um, focus on immoral art really didn't focus on the artist. It focused on the content of the art itself. Yeah. Um, so is this, uh, is this work of literature arguing for a morally bad view, right? Do, do works of uh, art even present arguments, right? So a lot of the uh, literature on this, um, the academic literature was, was wondering like, if a um, work is ethically flawed, right? Maybe it presents a racist or a sexist point of view and defends it, let's say. Um, does that make it artistically or aesthetically flawed? Does it make it a bad work of art? And there's a lot of writing on that, right? To say like, well, some people argue, yes, right? You know, definitely, you know, uh, actually moral art is uh, better art because it's moral. You don't find that one defended too much. But what you do often find is uh, people arguing that um, art is made worse to the extent that it's ethically flawed if the ethical flaw interferes with people enjoying the fiction. So the idea that would, would be something like your, um, the example that's often given is uh, Rudyard Kipling, right? Who is uh, an English author, right? Wrote the Jungle Book stories, but also some poetry. And it's very, uh, it's very much in favor of English uh, imperialism at the time mm -hmm. that he was writing. And there's a sense where it's, you know, it hasn't aged well in that respect, right? Most of us don't think like taking up the white man's burden is a good thing to endorse. So the idea is that when you read this poem that otherwise is, you know, beautifully constructed and sort of uplifting, you come to that line and you're like, ooh, I don't like that. But, and now I'm not having the right reaction to the poem, so it makes it aesthetically flawed. So a lot of the academic literature was interested in this question between ethics and like how successful the art is in accomplishing what it wants to accomplish. That said, people have pushed back on it in other directions, like arguing that it's actually something of an achievement to um, make a immoral character likable. So in, in the US, the example that I think was um, is pretty common is The Sopranos, right? Mm. Tony Soprano is a bad guy, but he's the hero of the show. So what does it mean to have um, what Ann Eaton calls a rough hero? or this kind of, and you might think it actually makes the show better because it's hard to get the audience to sympathize with an evil character. And mm. that makes it a kind of aesthetic achievement. So there's been a lot of work um, in that direction about whether art can be immoral or not. And I think I've, I, I largely agree with that. I think there are works of art that present, um, uh, and I should say endorse immoral uh, um immoral points of view. And I think that uh, often the interesting philosophical question is, does that make them better or worse as art? And I think that's, uh, that's sometimes really challenging. Um, interestingly, though, I didn't take it up too much in this book, because I think the question was like, let's say the work itself is fairly unobjectionable, right? There's nothing really wrong, like in terms of content with uh, Michael Jackson's hit thriller, right? It's, you know, going to the movies and seeing horror shows and then dancing like a zombie, right? What's, what's not to love? Um, but then you wonder, uh, okay, if I continue to listen to that at Halloween, right, or if I, you know, have a dance party to that, am I supporting the artist who did some pretty horrible things in his private life? And that, that was the question that I was interested uh, more. So then um, that goes to your question of whether you can separate the art from the artist. And I'm afraid that my answer is uh, the kind of boring academic answer of like, well, it depends. Right. Um, what I argue in setting up the book, and not just because there would be, uh, you know, no book otherwise, is that uh, there's really not an easy answer to the question, because sometimes it seems that we can very easily separate the art from the artist. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it often is easier if the artist has been long dead, right, or if the art is one that we don't typically. Um, where we don't typically think about the character of the artist while we're enjoying the work, right? So an example of this might be something like uh, Beethoven's piano sonatas, right? Beethoven was famously very arrogant and kind of a jerk, you know, because he's basically a rock star of his day. He did what he wanted and was, you know, famously rude to everybody, but you don't hear that come through 
in the piano sonatas, you hear beautiful music and that's what you respond to aesthetically. So there's a, a sense in which like the composer fades into the background. Um, that's very different than something like comedy, right? Where uh, the persona that the comedian puts forward very much depends on, um, or rather the, how we react to their comedy depends on the persona that they put forward. So knowing that uh, Louis C.K., for example, is a complete sleaze or that Bill Cosby uh, sexually assaulted women really makes it hard to view their work in the same way. And I think that, um, so you can't really have an easy answer in either direction. You can't say completely separate the art from the artist or uh, it's always relevant because sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And I think we have a pretty good intuitive sense of like when we care, but figuring out why is sometimes a little bit harder. And that's part of what I try to do in uh, some of the book. Mm -hmm. But let's say that the art itself is appreciated by people and it makes people feel good and brings value to people's lives. Mm -hmm. Do you think that even if the artist himself is immoral, people should praise his art as a sort of incentive for him to dedicate himself more to the art and less. Oh, good. Like, so the idea is like, if I say like, it, it's kind of like training a child, like, good job, good job, yeah, make yeah. the art, don't abuse the people, right? That's yeah, what like. something um, like that, yeah. So part of me, uh, you know, a lot of what I think about, or thought about when I was writing this is whether what we are trying to do when we listen to an artist or purchase their product is whether it's effective, right? And a lot of what I argue in the first couple chapters is that we don't really have as much power as end consumers as we think we do, especially when we're talking about uh, somebody with like an estate the size of Michael Jackson's, right? The, I mean, if I listened to a Michael Jackson song every day on Spotify, and we assume he gets the best rate for artists because he's Michael Jackson, at the end of the year, it's the equivalent of like a cup of coffee. It's <laughs> there. I'm just not moving the needle enough to yeah. really communicate with with my choices. Um, but let's pretend that it did work, right? <laughs> or that we could uh, encourage them that way. I think the the worry that you would have is that what incentive would they have to change their behavior, right? If you say uh, I'm going to appreciate the good parts of um, Cosby's comedy, right? in the hopes that he recognizes that like what we love about Cosby is, uh, you know, the sort of incisive commentary on the family and the family man persona that he puts forward. I, I would have to say that I think from Cosby's perspective, it looks like that then it just looks like we just don't care what he was doing behind the scenes in the dressing room. We'd say like, well, I guess we're all cool with that, right? Um, the uh, philosophers, um, Alfred Archer and Ben Matheson have a really cool paper where they are, uh, they consider like this idea of admiration. So they're thinking of like when uh, famous artists get awards. And the problem is that, you know, we can say the award is for your performance in this movie, but if you're also a bad person, like, admiration tends to kind of like splash around a little bit, right? And it's like uh, the sort of phenomenon where the sports star plays well on the field. So we think he's a good person overall, right? So we're not really good, I think, about separating our feelings for the artwork from the artist. Um, so that might be a little tricky, right? To say that we're going to uh, suggest to the artist, you should do more of this and less of the abuse like through our purchases. I think, th I think the message just gets lost, unfortunately. Um, and I think, you know, just as a side note, I think one reason we care about this so much is the failure of uh, other institutions to do what they were supposed to do, right? Like if Michael Jackson had been arrested in the uh, late eighties and sent to jail for, you know, child uh, molestation. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of like the outcome that would be like best from a justice perspective, right? He would have had his day in court. He would have been, I mean, he, he was eventually brought to court, but like it, right now the consensus seems to be that, you know, he actually did do the things he was accused of and that there was a mis miscarriage of justice, but like, what we're trying to do, I think sometimes after the fact is like justice, the justice system didn't work. And I think this is especially true in a lot of the cases of the Me Too movement, right? The justice system didn't work. Nobody spoke out when this person was abusive. They went on to have a great career. So it's like the only tool we have left is to try to, you know, take that away from them. And that's not really the right tool for the job, right? Like 
it doesn't really seem to be like, yeah, the fitting punishment for rape is that you don't get to be a comedian. I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. No, like that's not what that's not how we want at all. Like rape, rape is the kind of thing that should send you to prison. It might also destroy your comedy career, but like that's not like it's the wrong tool for the job. Um, so I think that often we we care about this a lot because we are, you know, rightfully upset that this person has gotten away with something, you know, gravely wrong. And this is kind of like the only way we as as fans can do anything about it. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter, but I can like take my mom's old Cosby albums on vinyl and throw them in the trash. And at least I'll feel better right, about this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering, let's say that, for example, an artist is convicted and goes to jail and spends a few years there. I, I mean, does he also deserve for sort of his work to be cancelled or people to not to no longer buy the whatever kind of art he produces yeah, i mean uh, isn't that going too far in terms of the condemnation sort of right so i on the one on the one hand i agree right like ideally what you want is i mean and this is like pie in the sky and not reflecting actual justice systems at all but yeah, what yeah, sure, sure. the person served their time right so now they get to go back and do and uh do what they want um and you know it shouldn't be a mark against them right if they're still a great comedian or if there's or, or still a great musician um but i think it's actually a little more complicated i mean one because of this weird uh identification that we tend to do especially with artists that we love it's not that we love the music but we're favorably inclined towards them which might be a bit of a concern but i also think that there's um there's kind of a different problem here too and it's one that I'm not really sure how to express, but think about it like this. There are lots of comedians and artists and musicians out there and nobody really, no one musician has a right to an audience, right? So in one sense, if people say like, look, you, um, you know, sexually assaulted people and you've apologized or you served your time or whatever, but, you know, attention spans are short and there's all these other comedians and musicians or whatever who haven't done anything wrong who might as well get my time it's really hard to argue that like they have a right to try maybe they have a right to try to make a comeback but they're also in a business that is really dependent on public perception and public opinion of them and one where you know tastes are very fickle right so um i guess the line i, I wind up taking in the book mostly is that there's usually no moral obligation in like the ordinary sort of consumer case to give up an artist who you otherwise like, right? Because they've done something wrong. Because most of the time what you're doing won't matter. It's like, it just doesn't matter enough. But I also don't think um, that like you have to continue to like try to get over it and like them if you don't, right? So if you, um, so let's say uh, there's two, two Bill Cosby fans, right? And one of them, reads about the allegations and the uh, well, now convictions and says, uh, you know what, I, I just can't deal with his comedy anymore because every time I try to watch the Cosby show, all I can think about is that he was basically in his second decade of like drugging and raping people. And I just don't find it funny. Cool. Don't watch Cosby then, right? You, like you have no obligation to get over that. But if you are somebody who, you know, learns all that, agrees that what Cosby did is wrong. And you said, you know, I still think the Noah's Ark sketch is the funniest thing that I ever, I ever heard. And I really love it. I don't think you have an obligation to get over that either. Right. So I guess the, from the perspective of an artist who's trying to come back from, uh, you know, uh, like recover their careers, I'd say, well, look, you're going to have a hard time because a lot of people are not going to be interested in your work because you have a lot of competition from people who weren't, um, who didn't harm other people, right? You're, I mean, this is in, in some way, it's like live by the market, die by the market. And one of the problems here is you don't have a right to an audience as a performer. Um, and I don't think we're uh, under much of an obligation to give them a second chance if we don't want to, right? Um, it's a, so I'm kind of threading a, a careful middle ground here, but I, I think basically, uh, yeah, I mean, it might be the case that, you know, people don't find you funny anymore. Yeah. And, that's because uh, what you did ruined your comedy. And no, like 
to, to ask people to pretend that they never heard it uh, so that they could continue to enjoy your comedy. And it's like, well, good luck with that, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. But I mean, do you think that uh, an artist should be condemned in terms of people no longer consuming his art or something like that just because he or she is accused of a crime before he is legally judged and all of that yes. because i mean i was just thinking that it's yeah. not it, it's not it's not anything against the me too movement or the uh, more recently the, the can cancel culture or something like that but right. uh, i mean there's a good argument to be made that perhaps particularly in the me too movement there were some people making some extreme claims like for example the idea of believe all women and stuff like that like i i mean considering people uh i i, I mean without their going through proper judgment a proper yeah. trial consider them guilty so uh, i mean do, do you think that uh, don't you think that's going a little bit too far so i think there's a lot to say here right um so one um one position that I hold very dearly is that like social media is a poor substitute for the justice system, right? <laughs> yeah. Because like, but that's why that's like, that's why you have courts and that's why you have evidence and that's why you have the presumption of innocence. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a philosopher at Oxford whose name is escaping me. Um, Amia Srinivasan, I think. I'm not quite sure how to say her name. Um, but she uh, she has said in particular that one of the, the challenges of something like believe all women is that it's like which women are likely to get believed and what do their accusers look like when people are ready to believe them and how that can perpetuate uh, right. injustice too, right? Um, but all that aside, I think um, one of the challenges here, and one of the things that I, I, I write about in the fifth chapter, which mostly focuses on cancellation, is that a lot of times what the person is accused of, um, I'm thinking of the Aziz Ansari case and the Louis C.K. cases, are legally possibly not, um, not actionable, right? Um, it's, it would be very hard for uh, you know what Ansari's um, accuser accused him of to get that heard in court, right? And Louis C.K. stuff is just weird, right? It's just kind of like inappropriate and sexually harassing colleagues, but it's all just like it, it's really creepy, and most of it, and there isn't a court case attached to it, right? So a lot of times we're we're talking about things that are on like the periphery of the. Um, uh, the legal system where we don't feel like there's probably not a legal remedy for being a creep right um and the question is what do you do when you learn about that um the one thing i will say about uh social media and you know what's often dubbed cancel culture uh is that um social media mobs are very weird because they're kind of fickle right um it's uh, it's very much a case of like jump on the bandwagon, move on this now, cancel so and so, and uh, the advice I give in the book is just to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a day and waiting, right? <laughs> like you could say, I, you know, I love this artist. This accusation's gone on. I can take a day to reevaluate it, and I also don't have to post what I think about it on social media immediately, right? Like there's this whole. Uh, middle ground of just like keeping your mouth shut and waiting that I think sometimes would help in cases like this because it's uh, the the concern, especially with uh, like a social media type mob is that it's very hard to call back, right? If you find out that you were wrong um, right. about something, right? You can't, uh, like because it's not a formalized justice procedure, there's not a way of saying like, oh, sorry, you're uncanceled now, right? <laughs> because uncanceling somebody is completely boring compared to, you know, canceling the next person or, you know, following Squid Game on Netflix or whatever. Uh, like, <laughs> you've got other things to do and the, and the attention span is so short. It's that it's a bad medium for thinking of it as, um, you know, meeting out justice of any kind. Um, I think if you wanted to defend it, you know, you'd have to say something more like what you're doing on social media when you argue that you're canceling an artist or something is that you're, uh, signaling and i mean this in a positive way to other people about like what kind of behavior you think is acceptable right and sort of like you're setting the tone and saying like i don't like people like this i don't like um you know 
I don't want to be around people uh, who behave in this way and good people should agree with me, right? And when you do something like that, you're kind of setting the tone and that can be a very positive thing or a negative thing. But I think that's a better way of thinking about what's going on than thinking about it as a substitute for justice because the substitute for justice, it just doesn't work, right? Um, it's uh, it's not a court system. It, I mean, it also doesn't have like the, it's not the right kind of punishment either, right? To say like, well, if you sexually assault somebody, you can't be famous. And I'm thinking here, like, if you sexually assault somebody, like, you should be in prison, right? Like, just not being, I'm not famous, right? That's not a punishment. <laughs> that's just, uh, that's just ordinary life, right? And so right. Um, I think it's less about, uh, you know, whether it's deserved or not, but it's just, it's just kind of like a category mismatch, right? So they, what, what, what we're trying to do, and again, it's the failure of institutions. If, if we could reliably say, like, look, when these guys assault co-stars, they go to jail, you'd feel a lot less, uh, I think, of the pool to say, like, I have to do something with, like, my viewing behavior because that, uh, that's, like, the only option that we ha have left right now, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, do you think there are instances where people would be morally obliged to condemn artists? Uh, I mean, in the abstract, sure, right? You know, artists whose work is actively harming other people, right? I think, you know, like you, you can come up with like the philosophy classroom, really easy cases, right? Like <laughs> if this artist, you know, involves the murder of young children, like, okay, yeah, right obviously condemned. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, what we're talking about in part are things that are um, not easy classroom cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, where uh, either it's very clear that they did something wrong, but that it was hidden for a long time, right? Because that's often, often how it works, right? So now yeah. it's not just you're deciding, like, like the philosophy class example, hey, this artist eats babies, should we listen to his work? It's more like, you've listened to this artist for years, and now we've discovered that they eat babies. What do you do uh, in response to their artwork now, I think is part of it. So yeah, I'd say like in the abstract, sure. Um, you can think of, of cases uh, where it just might not make sense to pursue that person's work. But I, I think there's a lot of considerations here, right? And none of them are, are completely decisive. I mean, for any artist who eats babies, right? I can probably find another artist that I enjoy just as much who doesn't do that, right? Um, and I can probably uh, find uh, another artist if this is, you know, seriously important to me, if I wanted to like make sure that my Spotify playlist contained nobody who um, uh, committed sexual assault. That could be a way of curating my aesthetic life. But I think most of the time, that's not the case we're faced with, right? We're, ca we're faced with cases where we discover belatedly that somebody whose work we've already made use of or uh, enjoyed um, has done something uh, either seriously wrong or less seriously wrong. Like there's a lot of, uh, of competing considerations um, about uh, what what we should do in response to learning something like this. Um, in the book, I mostly fo focus on consumers, mostly because that's kind of like, I think the case that we find ourselves in. Should I listen to something? But I'm really interested in the question of people who are um, performing or inspired by, or maybe who consider themselves artists, right? Because I keep thinking of uh, the, the case of somebody who say is a contemporary rock musician, right? Who counts Michael Jackson as one of their influences. Like, how do you undo an influence from your life, right? How do you say, like, the biggest pop star of all time who influenced how everybody, you know, carried themselves, the kind of sounds that, that uh, became popular, like, it basically had a whole historical influence just on music, like, let, let alone the persona. How do you erase that? Or could you even, right? And do you, do you say, like, I don't, um, I don't purchase the person's work anymore, but you know, their sound influenced how I developed my own sound. So I think that that's, that's a really hard question. And I don't quite know how to answer that one. Um, but I think it's, it's one that, that's certainly really interesting. By the way, on that point, do you yeah. think that if someone declares that he or she was influenced by an immoral artist, and we do in fact know that that person did bad right. things? I mean, do you think that someone who expresses that should 
also be condemned for doing it. I think it depends on what they're what like. It would really depend on the specific case. Like if they're kind of like, yes, you know, so and so was a Nazi, and that's what I love about them. <laughs> like, that's probably not something you want to support. But I think, um, in general, I think we're used to, especially if you're thinking of. Um, you know, an artist's sound that you liked, right? Or a painting technique, right? Or if you were thinking about the influence that uh, a certain book had on you when you were a certain age. I think that in practice, we are, we find it quite reasonable in some cases to say, yeah, what I liked about this was, uh, you know, this musical figure or this motif or uh, the fame that this person enjoyed. That's what I'm going for. And I reject the rest of that. I mean, you might find it creepy, too, if that's the only person they can talk about all the time, right? Um, you might say, like, and I think it would be fair to say, like, so, you know, you claim to, uh, you know, you count Michael Jackson as a huge influence on the development of your work. What do you, how do you reconcile that with what he did? Like, I think you would have to have an answer for that, right? Um, but I don't think there's uh, any particular reason to uh, automatically condemn somebody for that because i do think in a lot of cases like i said you can't really generalize it's the boring academic answer of it depends but you can separate the art from the artist and when we do that uh you can say like look i found the sound really interesting i but i don't support you know child molestation or what have you i think is a completely uh fair position for somebody to hold right mm -hmm. Do you think that particular moral sensibilities here also matter, like, for example, some political ones like the conservatives considering abortion immoral, so let's say that they would condemn a female artist for having, mm -hmm. an, having an abortion, or, for example, let's say in some more conservative countries like Afghanistan now with the Taliban's, they would condemn someone for depicting uh, nude females, something like that. I mean, do right. you think that th are those also questions that you think about or not? Um, I didn't specifically think about it too much um, with respect to like different cultural starting points or different mm -hmm. cultures. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's definitely something that's uh, worth thinking about because um, especially because art is so often used to push back on, you know, uh, dominant political structures, right? You think of art as protest or art as political commentary. Um, so it's often not surprising, right? That the, you know, I, the, uh, like the stereotype of the, you know, conservative old politician doesn't like the music that these kids these days are playing, right? Because it's undermining family values. I think I've been hearing that yeah. my entire life, right? Like, this, this music undermines family values. And like for a while, like in the 90s, that was like how you knew it was good music, right? It had like the politicians upset. Um, <laughs> so I think that uh, that's definitely a, a really interesting question is that uh, what we find um, offensive in the art or by the artist is going to be, of course, somewhat culturally uh, situated, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think for the question of then what to do about the immoral artist though is often going to be asked uh, from a perspective within that culture, right? So if you are a uh, conservative Christian who is opposed to abortion and you discover that your favorite artist um, had an abortion or supports, uh, um, supports choice, for you, that's going to be a dilemma, right? In the way that it's not going to be for somebody who doesn't have that political standpoint, right? So that's, that's kind of the easy answer to the question. But I think there's a, 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 a deeper version of the question which is to say that like, doesn't art sometimes have to push boundaries because often what art does is raise political questions or push back on um, you know, dominant institutions. And so there's a sense where not all art is immoral, but uh, a lot of good art is going to be uh, counter to the dominant culture. Um, and so whatever answer we give to the question of immoral artists, hopefully won't push back on, you know, rock and roll <laughs> criticizing institutions or uh, poets um, writing about, uh, you know, powerful people or, or uh, whatever, uh, um, whatever instance in history you want to pick, right? So I think, uh, I think that's a good question. And it's, it's one I didn't specifically take up about how it could vary with context. But I think that's absolutely right. 
um, if you look at the kinds of uh, pictures or stories that were thought to be shocking 150 years ago, right, where they won't write the word hell in print, they'll, you know, write a capital H and then a dash because it's too shocking to sensibilities. And then you see uh, uh, the kinds of language, for example, that's, uh, you know, more or less acceptable on Netflix or on YouTube. Uh, you say like, well, you know, times have changed in terms of what we find shocking or what we find offensive. Uh, and that's going to, uh, that's going to vary how we interpret the artists too, especially ones whose work uh, was made some time ago and that we're still engaging with now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that in a way it circles all the way back to, I think, my second question where I asked you if you approached the book from uh, any specific yeah. uh, moral standpoint, because I mean, as I said, if we look across different cultures and people with different from different political mm. uh, political sensitivities, let's say. I, I mean, they usually hold different moral values, and so there there would be a plurality right. of views in terms of what they consider to be moral or not, and what artists they think should be condemned. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm just as a side point, right? To kind of uh, elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, you could think of in terms of uh, moral theories, but also like what moral standpoint did I assume? Mm -hmm. uh, while going through this. And I guess the standpoint I uh, uh, picked, although I don't think I, I thought about it this much, was sort of like, what's in the headlines that we're concerned about now? And that pretty much maps on to, you know, educated, uh, white, Western liberal, right? Um, <laughs> and like, we're concerned about this, this set of issues. But to, on that point, though, um, most of my uh, childhood, right, I would have associated a position of like canceling an artist, although we didn't use the term, um, with a more conservative religious view, right? That like, mm -hmm. this artist is bad, you know, we're, you know, I'm not old enough to have burned Beatles albums, but they did that, right? Or, uh, or to, uh, you know, reject this because it's immoral um, is more of a position that I would have associated uh, with a more conservative position. Um, and what's interesting um, is that in some ways that seems to be uh, I'm speculating here a little bit, but flipping a little bit right now. It's um, both sides seem to be interested in canceling people that they they don't like, um, and that was a position that at least at least as a younger person, without giving uh, too much thought. And I'm not a sociologist here, so if I'm wrong, that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> it would have been identified with uh, a more conservative sensibility, right? That's the side that wants censorship, right? That's the side that wants, you know. The parental advisory uh, uh, labels on all of the music and uh, you know says that that's not something that you should be watching um, and now um, we're getting pushback um, saying like actually you know both sides care about the apparent morality of their entertainment um, uh, maybe we just needed social media I don't know <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, that perhaps in her childhood, uh, what we would now call cancelling was associated more with the politically conservative, because I, I mean, I remember, for example, that, uh, of course, I, I didn't live back then, but it, it isn't, isn't it, wasn't it the case that back in the 70s or something like that, you in the US still had things like, for example, uh, comedians uh, ever getting prison sentences for using certain words for example oh, yeah, for insanity, I, think, right? I, I think george yeah. carlin that's got before it. my time too i'm not that old but <laughs> but yeah. it's uh but yeah like the idea that you could have uh, comedians brought up on obscenity charges right yeah. um or uh, uh lenny bruce famously that's uh you know um was always getting into trouble for uh <laughs> violating local obscenity laws um and that's I mean, one, that seems so strange compared to like all the stuff that I can just stream on Netflix right uh, right now. But also that it did seem like that was more of a, you know, small town, conservative, protect our values sort of ideology. And now that um, for, you know, many good reasons, right, like that we're recognizing that sexual assault is uh, a bad thing, like as a community and not just as the people who are kind of like, yes, this was always bad, right? Um, that we see that a little bit more on uh, a broader section of the political spectrum. Um, but I think that that uh, part of that definitely informs my uh, my approach to the book, which is which is like I remember growing up hearing that you shouldn't listen to this because it's devil music or you shouldn't <laughs> listen to that because that's a bad person. And it turned out to usually to be pretty good art. Right. So uh, now 
uh, so I think I was primed just growing up to think like, oh, of course you separate the art from the artist. Like, that's what you have to do if you want to listen to good rock music, right? Um, but now it seems, I think, a, a different kind of question, right? Like how, and a more, I think a more informative question, like how do you interpret somebody's work in light of what you know about their, um, their personal life? It also might be the case that we just know a lot more too, right? I, I don't talk about this a lot in the book, but I think social media certainly makes us feel like we know more about the artists than we ever have before, right? Like I can look what what Taylor Swift had for breakfast or, <laughs> you know, what new album is, is coming out. And the person, I know they're all their political beliefs because they're probably tweeting about them. And this is something that uh, I don't know if I would have known uh, about unless you were following like, the press and the and you happen to get that newspaper or you happen to be you know reading that magazine it's it's a lot more accessible now and of course makes it a lot easier for people to um, form quick judgments mm -hmm. so we've been talking a lot about the artists and the consumers what about the platforms i mean that in fact give a platform to the artists and produce their work help them promote their work and stuff like that i mean the, what role do they play there when it comes to immorality in this case? This is good. I didn't take up this question at all in the book, by the way, because I looked at this. I'm like, what am I going to be able to talk about well? And I'm like, I'm going to focus on consumers. Um, but I think um, one thing I, I do think is that people with more influence, right, uh, platforms, institutions, even people in the industry have more of a responsibility um, to affect the things that uh, they can affect, right? Like that they can, I mean, you think of organizing a local band festival, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you know that one of the bands that you're putting on the lead singer is, uh, you know, harasses people, let's say, um, you know, you might, uh, you might feel more of a responsibility as the person who's booking the act to say, what kind of festival do I want to put together? Who who do I want to be on the stage, right? And you might say, look, there's lots of considerations that come into it, right? There's financial ones. Is this person going to be a draw? There's aesthetic ones. Is their music good? Uh, but you also might say, like, is this the sort of person I want to promote? And I think that's a completely legitimate question, right? To say, like, do I want to, to uh, support this guy's you know, or, or gal's uh, um, career, given what I know about them? And I think basically that scales, right? The more power you have in the industry, the more of a responsibility you have to address the problems. But I think this parallels pretty much everything else. Um, one thing I do say in the book is that when I'm thinking about, you know, your choices as a consumer and what they affect, like whether I listen to Michael Jackson or not makes almost no effect on the world, right? It's just imperceptible. It's going to matter a lot more if I'm concerned about uh, victims of sexual assault or harassment, how I conduct myself in my job as a college professor, right? Am I the sort of person that students can come and talk to? Do I know how to uh, hook them up with counseling resources? Do I speak up when we are creating policies to make sure that they're fair and equitable? And I think that that's going to be true of people who are um, better placed in the entertainment industry, right? It, if you are a, uh, you know, a director or a producer and you say, look, I'm just not going to hire people who have this history, right? You have, you wield incredible power. Um, mm -hmm. And if, on the other hand, you say, I don't care about any of that, you're also in a position to say, like, yeah, I've actually condoned that. Um, and so I think it kind of scales with where you are um, organizationally and the kind of power that you have. Um, and in the book, I focused on the consumer mostly because uh, it was uh, very hard to tease out a lot of those issues. And I thought, you know, if I'm trying to uh, keep the book relatively focused on what we do, like most of us aren't in the position to hand somebody an Oscar, right? <laughs> if you are, if you are, you have a different, you have a different set of concerns, but you also have a lot more power, um, and you can actually be effective. And one of the, one of the themes that I kept coming back to when I was writing the book is how much power does the end consumer actually have, especially if we're talking about work that you already own, right? I know we all stream everything these days, but for a lot of us, it's like, I bought the DVD 20 years ago. What does it matter if I rewatch it now? Like that doesn't put more money in the artist's pocket. That's already done. Burning the DVD doesn't do anything to like take the money back from them. So as a consumer, I, th I feel like whatever's going on here, it can't really be about like 
causal power to change behavior. But that's very different than if you're the person working in the industry. Um, platforms are hard. Platforms, I don't know what to do about. Like, and I think we're having a big debate about that right now. Like, what's Facebook's responsibility to democracy? What should Spotify do? Um, uh, should Spotify continue to uh, stream R. Kelly, right? Um, should uh, YouTube host videos of, uh, you know, artists who um, are, are thought to be uh, immoral? And I think that's, that's a really tough question. And I have no idea what I'd say about that because, well, there's all these questions about like free speech and, but, you know, and private corporations and so many things come together there. I think it's a very big question and one that I just, I don't feel like I've thought through it enough to say anything confidently. Um, I can yeah. say stupid things, uh, not, <laughs> not smart ones probably. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. It's complicated. Okay, yeah. so uh, just one last question and now focusing more on the consumer side of things. So would you call the kinds of questions you explore in this book and that perhaps you think consumers should think about, uh, would you call them ethical consumption? And do you think that they would apply to domains other than art? Like, I don't know, one that very easily comes to mind is veganism and animal products yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I do think it applies, but maybe not in the way that it will make everybody happy, right? Um, okay. So when I was, <laughs> was thinking about uh, this kind of argument, I mean, when I was uh, you know, drafting, especially the first chapter, I'm thinking, okay, so what actually happens when I decide that I'm boycotting an artist and I'm not going to stream them anymore? Um, and whether uh, collective action generally, right? What are the, what's the likelihood that a consumer boycott succeeds? And when I started looking into it, it was very depressing because uh, most consumer boycotts fail and most of the ones that succeed, and this isn't really a knock against them, but they see, succeed kind of um, indirectly, right? By putting pressure on advertisers or by getting enough media attention. It's not usually the case that we just stop buying their products and they don't make any money anymore. Uh, and that's that's like a... That's like a fantasy, right? So then the worry then is like, doesn't this apply to other things besides uh, listening to uh, immoral artists? Um, sure, <laughs> right? And that's the worry, right? Do I have an obligation to be uh, vegan um, in the knowledge that would be good for the environment if everybody were vegan, but also in the knowledge that probably nobody else, there's not going to be a sufficient number of people to uh, join join me in it. I think that's a really hard question. Like, and I worry that the answer is like the causal eff and efficacy argument seems to apply to lots of cases. Should I vote, right? Mm -hmm. Should I bike to work instead of drive um, for this uh, small effect on climate change? And I think the answer that I'm personally coming around to, um, but I'm still thinking through is that I think this means that it's really hard to solve big institutional problems with individual action, right? If you want to solve, uh, you know, climate change or a culture of sexual harassment or, uh, you know, get people to eat less meat. Um, you need you need institutional power to do that and trying to solve it by um, focusing on the end consumer uh, might help create the conditions for, you know, institutional change, right? Like there's something about saying like, hey, lots of people are interested in uh, meatless Mondays or reducing their meat consumption. Uh, that will maybe spur institutional action, but a lot of uh, it's a very depressing conclusion, right? That a lot of what we want to do to change the world is as individuals, we're not terribly powerful. And that at least uh, at least in the US, a lot of the rhetoric focuses on the power of the individual. It's like, you know, think globally, act locally. I'm like, but what if acting like locally doesn't do anything but inconvenience yeah. me <laughs> because I can't, it can, control the global supply chain that, you know, brought this product to my door, right? Um, because when I first started thinking about this, like my initial go-to uh, case, um, at least in one of the drafts, and now I, I, I can't recall if I actually made it in, was thinking about like ethical consumption of um, like small luxuries, like I'm going to buy only fair trade coffee or uh, only fair trade cof uh, chocolate because those are uh, industries that are, you know, bad for the environment and bad for the worker. And they're also the kind of luxury where it's not too much, it's not too hard to pay a little more for your coffee to make sure that it's coming from a good source. And so that was originally how I was thinking about it. But then once you look into it, it's com just completely depressing. <laughs> and you say, like, as a, 
as a consumer, man, like I'm caught up in a, in a system that is far bigger than, it, than anything that I, like, I can't opt out of it. Right. The, there's no, you know, with any kind of like normal sort of life. Thing. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you mentioned voting, particularly it reminded me of another one of the books in this series, Why It's Okay to Ignore Politics by Christopher Yeah, I, <laughs> I haven't read it, but I, I, I wonder if there's a lot of um, like uh, overlap there, at least I don't know if they discuss voting, definitely. But this has been this has been a question, right? I mean, trying to figure out how to solve collective action problems mm -hmm. uh, in philosophy and political science. and uh, sometimes you can, you can get an argument that like, if I knew that everybody else were doing it, right? Like we all, like we all pinky swore to, uh, that we were all going to give up meat. Of course we'd make a dent, right? The question though is often practically, it's like, uh, what do we do if we know that everybody else isn't going to, right? And right. if my motivation for voting, right, is to, uh, change the political situation for the, the better, but I know that my vote, um, especially with uh, uh, where I live in the United States and with our electoral college, like my vote doesn't matter at all, right? Yeah. I, Utah is never gonna swing the national election. <laughs> um, so is it really worth my time? I mean, I do vote, but then I kind of, as I cast the ballot, I'm like, what am I doing here? Other than like, you know, having a little bit of an enjoyment of like as a right as, my, as a citizen and a representative democracy, and that's kind of cool, but I like, I don't think I'm actually gonna affect anything, right? And uh, you, you think about it in terms of um, climate footprint. It's kind of like, look, I just, I, I'm born into a society where it's very, very hard mm -hmm. not to be extraordinarily wasteful, even if you're doing all the right green things. Yeah. It's like, sorry, like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. The highway system was here. Um, I can walk more, I can bike more, but uh, realistically, we're just like wasteful and gluttonous and I don't see an easy consumer way out of this. So, yeah, so like my, my lesson is very depressing, right? So uh, tell your channel, hi channel, that like you should still continue to do good things, but um, don't think, dwell on too much about how it might be pointless because it'll just make you sad. Yeah, I, I will just take this opportunity to plug in my interview with Christopher Fryman because I have one with him on his book, Why It's Okay to Ignore Politics. So yeah. after, after this one, go watch that one. So Yeah, you should. You should. Uh, and I mean, the whole, the whole series is fun. Like yeah. everybody who wrote for it was... Uh, you know, sometimes defending something a little contrary, like why it's okay to make money, you know, uh, that's Jason Brennan's book, or just things like why it's okay to slack off, right? Um, I think I think there's one on uh, bad movies coming out uh, soon. Uh, yeah, by and, and, ba and bad choices. Yeah. Bad choices, right, yeah. And so um, I, I feel like, I feel like in some ways the titles are always a little misleading because it's like, oh, I'm going to say it's okay to like listen to all. And then I end up giving a thing that's kind of like, eh, you know, I'm sort of middle of the road. I'm like, but the, but it's fun. And I think, I think the series is interesting because there's often not a lot of focus on the kind of ordinary ethical questions that you have with your friends at the bar. Right. And that's how yeah. I think of the series It's maybe not how the editor thinks of the series, but I think of it as like, the sort of questions you have when you're kind of like, what are we supposed to do, right? Is it okay to be a slacker? This is like the philosophy grad lounge, right? Having a couple of drinks and then saying like, all right, so what are your best arguments for thinking that it's okay not to vote, right? Or it's yeah. okay to ignore politics and then just having fun with it. But I think it, it reflects like the kinds of questions people are interested in. Yeah, and I really love the series exactly because of those reasons. So, okay, so before we go, where can people find your work on the internet? Um, on the internet. Um, well, if you're trying to buy the book, I know it's available um, through the publisher, which is uh, Rutledge um, under Taylor and Francis, but you can also get it in the US on Amazon and I think internationally, possibly on Amazon. I know it's supposed to be um, published uh, in the UK too right mm -hmm. now. And obviously you were able to get it. So how did yeah. you go about getting the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was um, on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Amazon, the source of all things for good or for ill, right? <laughs> um, yeah. You can probably get it with an Alexa robot that will follow you around your house now, right? Um, and tell you what books you should read. Uh, but yeah, you can you can get the book on Amazon. And uh, also it's on the publisher's website. And I think... Um, 
I think right now the publisher actually has the better price on it, but uh, okay. Amazon also has free shipping, so <laughs> pick your poison. Uh, yeah. But. Okay, great. So, Dr. Thank Will, you. thank you so this much for taking. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Ernst Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Taffini, Keon Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.